Anyone who has studied or at least been exposed to Japanese philosophy knows that when children are raised in Japan, they are taught a concept called ikigai. In English, it translates to a reason for being. And if you can imagine three concentric circles, the first circle suggests, what do I love? The second circle suggests, what am I good at? And the third, what gets me paid? This is a model for vocational development that I am delighted to be able to share with you because this evening's guest is named Spencer Proffer. And when I think about all the people that I have come in contact with in the world, I don't think there's any individual, in my humble opinion, who better represents the intersection of what you love, what you're good at, and what gets you paid. It is my honor this evening to bring you to today's guest, Spencer. Welcome to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation. Thanks, Chuck. I think what you're doing is fantastic for the world because there's hope and faith and inspiration to the guests that I've heard on your shows, and I'm actually very honored and privileged to be on it, so thank you for inviting me. You are quite welcome. It's great. By way of introduction, for those of you who may not know Spencer Proffer, my guess is you know his music, and you know many of the projects that he has touched. Spencer is a producer of premium film and television content, utilizing music as the fundamental component both to entertain but also to have positive, lasting impact across the globe for all people of all races, of all colors. And he does what he does with so much love, kindness, and generosity. Spencer, in order to really fit that description, can you take us back to your ikigai? And my guess is between college and law school, you were making some pretty key decisions on what you wanted your life to be. Walk us through that background. Well, it's, it's pretty simple, Chuck. My parents are immigrants. I'm a dreamer. I personify the very essence of starting with nothing and looking for a better day. And we were really poor. My parents are immigrants from Poland. I was brought up, I uh, came to America when I was six. And when I got my BA at UCLA at 20 and I was in a band writing songs, my parents wanted me to have a secure future. They didn't think being a songwriter in a, in a band with hair to my shoulders was my future. So I went to law school, and that was at the age of 20. And I continued my law school um, journey, making music, writing songs, performing in my band. We had a couple of different record deals. And I came to the attention of a very visionary man named Clive Davis, who was running uh, CBS Records at the time, Columbia Records. And I was offered a choice to, I was signed to Columbia as a writer, artist, producer with my band. And I was offered one or two choices when I graduated, uh, either to have my option picked up or to take a job working for Clive. And I knew I couldn't sing that well, so I moved to New York. The age of 23 took the bar. And I made the life decision that I loved music, I got goosebumps, I had an education, and how, how I could possibly combine those two was something I was willing to go down that path to try. So at the age of 23, I moved to New York, and I started a new chapter. And when you came to New York, Spencer, in your mind as toward who you were in the world, were you musician, lawyer, producer, all of the above? What were you thinking? Well, I was a poor kid who wanted to learn from a master. Clive was a master. The roster appealed to me. I loved Dylan. I loved Streisand. I loved the music, Santana, Simon and Garfunkel. All the artists that were on that roster really, you know, gave me a big buzz. And at the same time, I wanted to learn how the contracts worked. I wanted to learn how the A&R process worked. So I kind of combined my love of music, my uh, ability to hear something and hear it on multi-levels. At the same time, I had a pretty good education. I had a scholarship in my third year. So I, I don't know, it was like I was a hybrid kind of a weird guy. Right. And what I was doing at 23 was learning and being a sponge 
from you know a company and a man who I thought was one of the most brilliant people I'd met in my life. Well, that leads you to the present day where you run an organization called Meteor 17, which is responsible for all these things you do. But what is interesting about your evolution is many of the people you work with are very specific in what they do. There is a musician, there is a sound engineer, and you, though, represent the integration of the creative side, the deal-making side, the legal side, and the business side. Is this a culmination of all the lessons you learned along the way in order to position yourself that way? I didn't do it, you know, overtly, consciously, but it was the evolution because I do understand what the words mean in an agreement, but I used that education to further my creative dreams. So the intersection of the two is just a process that started at 23, now I'm a few years older, and that's been kind of my journey. I've always, I've worked with great lawyers, but they pretty much back up what I do to make sure I don't screw the deals up. But I really do the business stuff to foster the creativity, my vision, and that of the people I work with, be it music artists during the years that I made records, today making, you know, music anchored documentaries and pictures where music counts around people that were there. Um, I'm from the inside coming out. A lot of people making these music docs are people from the outside of the business wanting a piece of it. But I get it because I've lived my life through it. When I consider your body of work, there are many artists you have worked with, which include Stevie Wonder, Eddie Money, Cheap Trick. These are such, and, and many more, which we can touch on, but this is such a diverse collection of artists. To our listeners who have to work with such diversity even more in this day and age, what have you learned about working with these different varieties as to how to keep yourself centered on success in spite of the differences in the artistic talents that you have worked with over the years? It's about the music. It's about the vision of the artist. And be it classical, be it country, be it rock, be it pop, be it jazz. My John Coltrane film that I produced, I had the good fortune of having Denzel Washington narrate uh, the words of Coltrane, directed by a brilliant director named John Scheinfeld. I just love music. And I understand it. I minored in music at UCLA as a political science major. And to me, it doesn't matter what kind of music it is. You know, you've got to stay in a lane. But the lane to me is, you know, kind of supporting an artist's vision. And if that artist is like Lamont Dozier, who I'm working with now on his uh, feature documentary, and he wrote all the key Supremes and Four Tops hits, and got an Academy Award nomination with Phil Collins. Lamont's a brilliant guy. I loved his music. Equally, I loved the rock music that Eddie Kramer engineered for the Stones, Zeppelin, and the Beatles, making his documentary. So the diversity of the styles is really only subject to the wonderfulness of the person who, you know, embraced that style. My gig is to bring it forward. I did that as a music producer, and I'm doing it now as a film producer. When we look at your body of work and you put it down on a piece of paper, it looks so simple. But I remember once when I was preparing for this show, you had stated that throughout the course of your evolution and transformation, that the most important word in the English language is no. What do we tell our listeners about your experiences when someone said no to you and what you did in response to their no. <laughs> it's kind of how I raised my two boys, Sterling and Morgan, which I used to use the analogy as they were coming up and I was coaching their teams. Babe Ruth hit the most home runs, but he also struck out the most. Um, yeah, I have many, many noble failures in my life and in my career. Things that I believed in, records that I made, songs I had written that didn't make it for one reason or another or they were rejected, or they didn't when I made my Quiet Riot records. Everybody at Epic and CBS Records hated that record. Who's, who knew it would you know, knock Thriller out of number one? <laughs> Shame but, on you for knocking Thriller out of number one. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, it was the first hard rock record to go number one in Billboard, which right. is kind of cool. Yeah. But the point is, I had that word no thrown at me so many times during the making of that record, making of the demos, which wound up becoming the album 
when I started laser light shows back in the 70s and my 20s, people thought I was out of my mind taking a Children of the Sun album that I had co-written with Billy Thorpe and turning it into a computer animated laser choreography, putting it into planetariums. People thought I was nuts. So it took nine months for me to finally get that record out and get it into the public. And when it hit the radio, the kids responded, the public responded. So the advice on no is... Drink it in, man, and if people say no to you, you keep going because every no can turn into a yes. There's a line in a song from a documentary I produced on a song called I Hope You Dance, and my favorite line in that is when one door closes, another one opens. So just get used to it. Anyone who's listening, get used to being rejected, but don't let it get you down. You just keep coming. If you believe in yourself, you believe in your vision, you get your goosebumps, you just keep going. And if it's no, it'll be a yes tomorrow. I'm going to recite some lyrics from the same song that, Spencer, I happen to have had in front of me before you even mentioned it. And I'd like to know what your involvement is with respect to these words and your transformation. I hope you never fear those mountains in the distance. Never settle for the path of least resistance. Living might mean taking chances, but they're worth taking. Loving might be a mistake, but it's worth making. Tell us about the evolution of that song and how it related to you and what our listeners can take from it. Well, my friends, Mark Sanders and Tia Sillers, wrote it back in the early 2000s. It resonated to my wife, Judy, and I like you can't believe because we lived by those words. And I was, had the good fortune to secure the rights to produce media on the precepts of the song, and I made a documentary on how the song touched people's lives. Uh, Joel Osteen, a brilliant um, speaker and impassioned uh, pastor, Maya Angelou, before she passed, Graham Nash uh, performed, Teach Your Children, Brian Wilson, God Only Knows, and we wove those people's um, visions of how songs touch people's lives into stories that the song influenced and affected you know, people who had experiences with some of those lyrics. And I wove that into a 90-minute documentary directed by John Scheinfeld, and it meant a lot to me to do that. We, I did it independently without getting a lot of notes because I wanted to make sure the vision was congruent with the lyrics that Tia and Mark wrote. So the essence of that experience was I brought to life words that I've lived by ever since I was in my 20s. Well, that, that leads us to something else that you're working on. I would hope that you're able to expand on it. There is certainly a sentiment for the gentleman named Elvis Presley that many of us in my generation have grown up and admired. Unfortunately, he he passed throughout, you know, 20 some years ago. So we don't get to listen to his music as much because he's not as conscious as he was when he was in the 50s and 60s. Tell us about the documentary you are making and what you hope that the millennial and Gen Z generation can learn from such an incredible star like Elvis. Well, it all goes back <clears throat> to the one guy who actually befriended Elvis and challenged the stranglehold that Colonel Tom Parker had on Elvis's career. Parker, <clears throat> excuse me, was Elvis's manager, and Steve Binder, who's been my friend for many decades, was the visionary director producer who put Elvis in black leather and made the comeback special on NBC, which was the second highest rated show. I think, on television behind the Beatles on Sullivan. So um, Steve is a dear, dear friend of mine. I love working with my friends because the politics go away and you just go after the essence of what you're trying to do. So Steve wrote a book that we partnered on publishing, which will come out next year. Uh, we premiered it at Graceland. Um, it's a tabletop book about his making of that comeback special. And our goal is, in partnering with authentic brands who now control, they own Graceland, they bought the estate, uh, making a documentary based on the book, the buddy story of Steve and Elvis, how they not only challenged Parker, but how Elvis actually made the first in-the-round um, event. We became, I guess, VH1's Unplugged was influenced by that. I give Steve Bender an awful lot of credit for having the vision to get Elvis to embrace what he wanted to do. 
and I think our documentary should hit those highlights and really bring to life the fact that you just follow your instinct and your dreams. Um, a fellow named Babs Lerman, who's one of the more brilliant filmmakers of our lifetime, is making a film that's been publicized now on Elvis's entire life. And what we're planning to do is telescope that 1968 special into a 90-minute feature doc to be directed again by John Scheinfeld, who did a brilliant job on my Coltrane and Hopi Dance films. And it kind of tees up that moment in Elvis's career where he actually teamed with a guy, Steve Bender, to challenge Colonel Parker. In Baz's movie, it's been announced that Tom Hanks will be playing Colonel Parker. So if we do the kind of job we expect to do on our documentary, it's a great appetizer that will lead into Baz's Warner Brothers film, which is coming sometime in 2021. There's something else, though, in your body of work that transcends music itself that takes historical events and makes them relevant to 2020. And what I'm thinking about is right now in our society, we speak a lot about diversity and inclusion. And while everybody, or at least I'd like to think most people know there is a Jackie Robinson in that of which films have been made and stories have been written about it, there is one sport where I think people don't know too much about that you are bringing back to life called Sweetwater. Tell us about that project. Well, a very close friend of mine, I'm godfather to his third child, Martin Gigi, has spent 12 years working with the estate of Nathan Sweetwater Clifton and sculpting his journey as the first African-American star in the NBA. And we are going to make that movie. I'm going to produce the film with Dahlia Weingart. Um, Weingart. She pronounces it many different ways, but she's just brilliant no matter which way you, you call her. And um, we are going to tell that story, and there are you know, trials, tribulations, how he, Nathan Sweetwater Clifton Sweets, as a gold globetrotter, uh, piped into the uh, New York Knicks and made his uh, statement and was an inspiration to all the basketball players who are playing the game today. And because I come from music, we're actually going to have a companion album of uh, hip-hop um, music uh, we're going to take artists who are currently um, doing that in a very significant way and pair them with many NBA superstars who can rap and hip-hop and who write. And we're going to focus on the themes of inclusion, inspiration, diversity, overcoming. And that will be a companion to the film, although the film itself will be scored by Lalo Schifrin and hopefully Marcus Miller in combination. Lalo, as you know, has written Mission Possible theme and is a family friend to Gigi. Uh, but we're going to have a companion record that will bring a current for kids of today on the themes of Sweetwater. And so you'll see the movie as a period film, but you'll feel the music timelessly. Like what actually Baz did a great job with The Great Gatsby, where he had Jay-Z bring a lot of cool hip music set against, juxtaposed against a uh, early 20s backdrop, which I thought was really very visionary. <clears throat> I'd like to switch the focus a bit. While this is an extraordinary body of work, or the interesting part about who is the Spencer inside, what is it that drives you to do these, and what do you look for in the human spirit for the projects that speak to you the most? Purity, integrity, and hope. Because every artist I've worked with Tim Story is a life coach. I'm doing a big event with him. Uh, we're going to premiere to Fathom Theaters and then take it downstream. He, he speaks about hope. He's a life coach. He's helped people from Lee Iacocca to Robert Downey Jr. to Quincy Jones to many others, you know, get it right. And that's what we're calling it. Sometimes you've got to go left before you get it right. I love Tim. I respect him. And the reason I'm working with him is because he inspires me. Lamont is like that in his writing. Eddie Kramer was like that in his engineering. So what I look for in the projects that I'm going to put my heart and time into is what I have in my marriage with my wife, someone who's inspired, someone who's visionary, someone who cares about the world. And I'd like to use media to get that message out because that's what I can do. Yeah. This is such an interesting story, but I'm going to come back to the no again. 
What have been these challenges in these twists and turns that you are able to reflect on that were transformative to you? I guess multiple times, so many no's that when they finally, and I stuck with it, when they finally hit the world and became super successful, laser light shows, quiet riot, working on Gods and Monsters, having the film get an Academy Award, doing a Broadway show that we had in repertory for seven years called It Ain't Nothing But the Blues, finally getting it onto into Lincoln Center and getting four Tony nominations. I think the biggest uh, up for me was all of those projects had massive rejection, massive, you know, no's, and I stuck with them because I loved them, I believed in them, I fought through for them, and when they hit the public, the public resonated. So that, to me, is a vindication. Some made a lot of money, some made a little money, and many projects I've done may have made no money, but if I get involved with them, I'm proud of them, and so I, you know, I'm at the point where, sure, I can take no, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Yeah, and when you take no or you hear no and you come back and you continue your fighting spirit, and I'm doing this for the benefit of the listener, what are the characteristics that you and your organization bring into this mountain that you are climbing? And I'm speaking on a very personal note. When you walk into those meetings, what are you feeling and what is your approach to, the, to making these things happen? Confidence, joy, that I think what I am either selling, pitching, or speaking of means something. It means something to me to start with. It mm-hmm. means something to the projects and the people that are part of that. So if I'm in a, in a meeting and I get rejected, I don't necessarily think the people are missing it. Maybe I didn't do a good job delivering it. But in my heart, if I believe in I'll take one meeting, I'll get blown out. I'll take another one, I'll get blown out. I'll just keep taking it. I mean, ultimately, it's possible that you strike out. Babe Ruth did. But that doesn't mean you don't get up at the plate and try again. And that happens a lot with Broadway. I'm partnered with some really cool guys, Corey Brunish and Russell Miller, who have produced a lot of stuff for the stage, Tony Winters. And they've told me many, many stories of stuff they've developed in repertory that never got beyond regional theater. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it graduates to Broadway. But anybody that's really good keeps coming. Lamont Dozier has written so many songs that never made it and were recorded during this Motown era, and then he's had a lot of number ones. So I think the lesson to be learned from all of this is if you really feel it, you just keep going, and as long as you can have the fiscal wherewithal. But when I grew up with uh, eating off a hot plate, and uh, one of my favorite songs was like a Rolling Stone that Dylan wrote back in 1965, the line was, when you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. So if you go into meetings and into projects knowing that you're starting with nothing, if it turns into something good for you, keep going. Yeah, and he also talks in that song that I think is really inspirational for many people who who seem to want to have everything figured out. He talks about the concept of the complete unknown. And I want to transition that into what we're going to close. As an entertainer, I, I'm certain you ask yourselves a few questions about what it is you are trying to bring to the market. So what I'm going to ask you in what we do in every show here is we ask ourselves, what do we want our listeners to think? What do we want them to feel? And what do we want them to do when this radio show is over? So Spencer, let's start with that. Thinking all the listeners out there, what do you want them to think about their careers and their transformations? I'll give you three words. You Dare to dream. Because it's all about that. Because what's in front of you is what's in front of you, but you can see if there's a brighter day. Sounds cliche, but it's actually true. Dream. You know, go for what really moves you. And if you've got to make a living, do that. But keep dreaming as you're doing that. And what do you want them to feel about the adversity and the challenges that are ahead of them? Well, what you can do with the adversity is come on as strong as you can in your own way with elegance, with grace and integrity. Don't lie, don't cheat, but, you know, keep pushing in your own way. Sometimes you can be an alpha personality. Sometimes you can be a passive person. But if you just pursue your goals and your dreams, um, 
you know, he, I know you got to make a living. Everybody does. But the best thing is to pursue your dreams and make a living doing that. Yeah, so that really gets to what do you want them to do. We have many listeners that are looking for inspiration, and your story is certainly a good one. But now we ask that if you were to give advice to a 27-year-old who is contemplating a career change and is a bit fearful about what the complete unknown is, what do you want them to do about it? Make a living, pay your bills, and keep chasing the thing that gives you goosebumps. I think if goosebumps are the core of what you do, whatever it is, if you're an accountant, you get off on moving numbers around, if you're a farmer and you like milking cows, or you're a songwriter and you want to write songs and tell stories, you just do the things that move your soul. And if you do that, you could get lucky. Just try and make a living as you're doing it, whatever you got to do. Well, that brings us back to the way we began the show and the concept of Ikigai. Spencer, you are someone who represents the intersection of what you love, what you're good at, and what gets you paid. And to our listeners, I hope that you will consider the words of wisdom and the insights that Spencer has offered. Because when we think about his reason for being... While he has accomplished an extraordinary amount, I think when we just get to the bare bones of who Spencer is, he is a guy who wakes up every day in the service of someone else's success. And Spencer, on behalf of all of my producers here in the studio, thank you so much for the time, the insight, and the wisdom that you have communicated to our listeners. Chuck, it's my pleasure. You keep going with your show because I think it does a lot for people. I hope your listener base expands beyond words because I think where you come from is what's really good for people to know, and it takes shows like yours to uh, get the word out. So thank you for having me. You are welcome. And to our listeners, thank you very much for tuning in to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation. I'm Chuck Garcia, and we really appreciate you tuning in. Good night.